So very quickly, um, thank you very much, Prof. Kenny, for this excellent exposition on some of the key factors and triggers leading to Islamophobia, which, by the way, it's not uh, fiction, but um, it's um, a matter of convenience for certain Muslim anti-democratic regimes and democratic governments of the so-called democratic governments uh, of the West. So it's a fact, uh, quantitatively proven, uh, and it's on the rise. Um, so um, we will have a discontent. Um, Professor Shad uh, will join us uh, with his uh, response and his uh, sharing of ideas on the issue and on the topic. Thank you. Professor Shad. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi and good afternoon. Um, I wish to thank Dr. Farooq for the honor of this invitation. I'm privileged to be part of this learned panel, though actually this is not my field of expertise. Now, on the issue, is Islamophobia on the rise? The answer is obviously yes. On the other hand, may I also point out that it could also be said, and Prof. Jeff uh, did suggest it, that in some respects, Orientalism, and may I add colonialism, conquest of Palestine, Iraq uh, were also clear evidence of past hatred and disrespect of Islam. And perhaps what we are witnessing today is that uh, latent, below the surface reservoir of hatred has spilled over. It is possible that due to a combination of geopolitical, political, economic, and other factors, what was always lurking in the subconscious has now emerged as an articulate, potent force. And what was politically incorrect a few years ago is now part of the mainstream discourse in many Western corridors of power in the media and in the blogosphere. So clearly, we have this unfortunate fact. Um, I'm more interested in what should we do about it? How should Muslims react to this deluge of hatred? What we have to do is to examine the causes, both external and internal, and propose some possible cures. Among the external causes I have in mind is that Islamophobia, number one, Islamophobia is a useful political construct, a winning electoral platform and an ideological campaign against an imagined threat. Donald Trump's success was partly due to this hate-mongering political speeches, his hate-mongering political speeches and actions. Uh, in Australia, Pauline Hanson uh, has warned her nation about the danger Australia will face because one day Sharia is going to take over. Uh, and something has to be done about it in Australia. That's what she said. In many countries, Muslims are relentlessly questioned about their loyalty to their state. Refer, for example, to the recent case of French Turk soccer player uh, Masoud Ozil, who met Turkish President uh, uh, Erdogan, and he was victimized for that. Uh, on the other hand, just uh, around the same time, former German uh, former, uh, former uh, German captain Lothar Matthäus met the Russian president Putin, and uh, there was no objection to that at all. So, um, lots of double standards operating. Uh, number two, Islamophobia is part of the politics of empire building. It is a factor in the imperial interests of global capitalism. It is a convenient political and moral tool to rationalize Western wars, conquests, and military intervention in many Muslim lands like Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, Palestine, Somalia, Pakistan. Islamophobia is the basis of the constant threats against Iran. And it is the basis for is support for Israel's genocidal policies. Now, um, a third factor uh, is 
Islamophobia is a convenient justification of the bloated security state that followed 9-11. High defense budgets in many Western countries, especially the USA, uh, and some of these countries have no discernible threat from, an, from any enemy. Now these budgets are sought to be justified by uh, this new enemy uh, that has been created. After the fall of communism, um, a new enemy had to be found and Islam is now the new enemy. Uh, of course, there are writings like the uh, theory of the clash of civilizations. So this association of Islam with terrorism, exaggerated though the association is, is used to justify illegal drone attacks, detention without trial, torture in internment camps, and authoritarian measures at home and abroad. Number four, the anti-immigrant wave has fueled anti-Muslim sentiments. But what is often forgotten is that a large percentage of the migrants or refugees who are reaching Western shores are doing that because of the devastation caused by Western initiated or supported wars, regime changes, coup d'etats and rebellions. Yemen and Syria are clear examples. Um, um, number five, the media, especially the internet, plays a significant role to portray Muslims as violent fanatics, misogynists, and IS um, loyalists. Islamophobia is, of course, a, a flourishing business. Now, I'm not against the media, but at the same time, I have to say this, that uh, people are using the media basically to defecate in outer space. <laughs> Very easy. Uh, just utter whatever you like without thinking, um, often anonymously, and um, clearly something needs to be done about a balance between, between freedom and responsibility, because I have to say this to you, freedom per se has no value. It's what freedom is for. It's the use and the sense of responsibility with which freedom is exercised. Um, Number six, there is a dichotomy between good and bad Muslims. Attempts by the RAND Corporation in the USA and by George Bush's World Muslim Outreach Center and other such organizations to frame a cultural and media campaign about civil democratic Islam is not really meant to combat terrorism, but to identify and create the right type of Muslim subject that can fit into the goals of American interest overseas. For many Western reformers of Islam, I say Western reformers of Islam, the Quran must be regarded as a set of symbols, metaphors, alleg allegory, and not the literal truth. But the problem is that most Muslims don't see the Quran this way and believe it to be the true word of God. Of course, open to interpretation. This leads to the creation of two groups of Muslims, the good Muslims who interpret Islam the Western way and the traditionalist bad Muslims who are used as a justification for Islamophobia. Number seven, secularism. There is this clash between the predominantly secular ideology of the Western governments and media and Islam's insistence that deen and dunya, religion, and the human world must travel together, that law and the state cannot be separated from morality. Uh, number eight, the rise of neoconservative think tanks following the Cold War have fueled anti-Muslim sentiments. And number nine, evangelism. I have to say this with sadness. There is intense competition, Prof, in our country between Christian evangelists and Muslim evangelists. And there is a case of uh, um, mutual hostility, mutual disregard of each other. Um, this was not so uh, um, till the 80s. But I think since the 80s, um, I, I'm, I'm calling both evangelists. Uh, I have to say this, the Sikhs, the Hindus, the Buddhists, they don't try to evangelize anyone. The problem is basically between Christian and uh, Muslim evangelists. Number 10, Islamophobia 
diverts attention from Western complicity in atrocities against Muslims in Myanmar, in India, occupied Palestine, Syria, Yemen, etc. Now, I have to also point out um, there's a lot of Muslim culpability uh, uh, involved in this Islamophobia that we see all around the world. I cannot deny that there is a rise of militant Islam in some parts of the world. And this is evidenced by the involvement of some Muslims in terrorism. Understandable reaction to many atrocities committed by isolated groups of deranged Muslims. Atrocities like 9-11 is, uh, um, is there, of course, um, in Germany, in France, in the USA. However, um, I have to point out that uh, um, the same uh, is not done when non-Muslims indulge in terrorism. Uh, the same reaction doesn't come when non-Muslims indulge in terrorism. Um, almost every day, Israel is indulging in terrorism in Palestine, but that is not regarded as uh, terrorism. Uh, in the USA itself, there are many acts of terrorism. Um, um, since 9-11, more than 700,000 Muslims have been interviewed by the FBI. Now, I understand that this comes to 50% of all Muslim households in the USA uh, uh, who have had one or the other family member <laughs> interviewed by the FBI. Another problem where Muslims are culpable is that there is over assertiveness by some Muslims in Western societies. For example, there are Muslim groups demanding that in um, English schools, pork should not be served. Now, um, why, why should British schools not serve pork when that's allowed uh, in their religion, in their society? Um, so I, I think this kind of over assertiveness, Muslims have got to learn to live with this fact that uh, their values the concept of cleanliness is not necessarily shared by others. Uh, number three, there is over assertiveness by Muslims in Muslim societies itself in ways that show insensitivity to the rights of minorities. There are in our country problems of unilateral conversion of non-Muslim kids by one parent um, um, and uh, uh, there is the famous case of Indira Gandhi. There are many other cases, but Indira Gandhi is perhaps the saddest one. Her child was taken away from her in 2009. This is now 2018. For the last nine years, she has not seen her infant child. Now, um, how can any religion, how can any system of ethics or morality justify this kind of behavior? Sharia courts are complicit. Our civil courts are complicit in this kind of atrocity. Sharia courts are exceeding their authority to adjudicate. Article 121 brackets 1A says that civil courts cannot interfere with Sharia courts in matters within Sharia court jurisdiction. But how can Sharia courts have jurisdiction when one of the parties to the case is a non-Muslim? Article, uh, sorry, Schedule 9, List 2, paragraph 1 clearly says, Sharia court shall have jurisdiction only over persons professing the religion of Islam. If in a case there are two parties or more than two parties and some of them are non-Muslims, clearly Sharia court should have no jurisdiction. But sadly, not only the Sharia courts are exercising jurisdiction, federal court, court of appeal and high court are often uh, agreeing that the matter is solely within the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. So there's a lot of over assertiveness and insensitivity by Muslim groups. And I can understand Islamophobia is not just a Western phenomena. Many non-Muslims in this country are scared of what would happen. Even though we have a supreme constitution, these things are happening. What would happen if there is hudud, if there is an Islamic state in this country? Emphasis on hudud. Um, there are issues like laundromats must be only for Muslims because uh, non-Muslims are supposedly unclean. P politicization of Islam as a means of gaining power and having large allocations from the taxpayer. For example, 
the Sharia Federal Authority receives 1.3 billion, not million, billion ringgit in annual allocations. There is racist and religious bigotry in opposing appointments. Chief Justice appointed uh, um, a few weeks ago is, happens to be a Christian. Um, um, he was the senior most federal court judge. In some countries, by the way, if seniority is disregarded in promotion, that is treated as an assault on judicial independence. India, Pakistan have cases on this point. Executive cannot bypass senior most judges because that is interference. But here, uh, appointment of a, a, a non-Muslim chief justice is regarded as a threat to Islam and as a threat to Malay rights. By the way, uh, Richard Malanjan was the senior most judge in the federal court and he has done a good job as uh, chief judge of the uh, Sabah Sarawak. Um, there is constant emphasis on an Islamic state in a multiracial society where nearly 40% of the population uh, today is non-Muslim, but actually at one time, 50% of the population was non-Muslim. In 1957, 50% of the population was non-Muslim. When Sabah Sarawak Singapore joined uh, Malaya to constitute Malaysia, in the case, government of Kalantan versus the government of the Federation of Malaya, one of the arguments given by the Kalantan government was, you can't bring Sabah Sarawak Singapore in because that changes the majority composition of this country. A Malay country is becoming a non-Malay country because with Sabah Sarawak Singapore, the Malay majority would have been surpassed in a very small manner, but nevertheless surpassed by the non-Malays. Now that's not my argument, that's the argument in the Malayan Law Journal given by the, by the government of Kalantan in opposing the entrance of Sabah Sarawak Singapore. So we have a very substantial non-Muslim population and talking of an Islamic state uh, 60 years after independence um, when the Perlambagan was drafted uh, there were several choices. One choice was uh, Brit parliamentary supremacy as in the UK that was rejected. Return to history, absolute monarchy that was rejected. Uh, supremacy of the Sharia that was not accepted. Supreme Constitution, that was accepted. Now, 61 years later, people are talking of fundamental change to the structure. I can understand why non-Muslims would be scared. Um, there is a conservative, intolerant, aggressive, Wahhabist, Salafist, Saudi type of approach to Islam. Um, and sadly, um, um, I have to say this, um, Malays today, I've forgotten about the moderate, inclusive, tolerant Malay culture. Malays today are more interested in uh, dressing, talking, behaving uh, uh, like the Arabs. Uh, and uh, it's very, very sad indeed because actually Malaysia had a winning combination. You know, in some countries they try to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. In this country we are trying to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. We had a winning setup. With all our flaws, we had a country where things worked, where democracy and religion, um, democracy and uh, uh, development could go together. But we want to change all that. There is disrespect for other religions. Uh, the message of Islam is lakum deenakum waliya deen but there are the Zakir Naiks of our society uh, there are organizations funded by the taxpayer uh, which actually um, in official sermons um, they are hate filled they describe other religions other races in a denigratory way perhaps, perhaps they are simply answering um, uh, such disrespect towards Islam on the internet but I, I think that's not a game that anyone can win. Um, so um, uh, this patronizing, condescending attitude towards other religions, for example, in Zakir Naik's uh, um, um, speeches and all, uh, I, I think this definitely scares a lot of people. 
there is intolerance of diversity within Islam. The Sharia groups in this country are very intolerant of diversity within Islam. Islam is a mansion with many rooms. There are many views of the garden, but I'm, I'm afraid that's not allowed. Uh, you cannot speak about Islam unless you have a ta'uliya, unless you have that accreditation given. A mufti from Perlis, at that time, former mufti from Perlis can come to Selangor and get arrested because he spoke without a ta'uliya. Now, this is really absolute madness. This is ridiculous, really, that a mufti uh, who uh, is well-renowned cannot come to another state and speak about Islam at a private house to which he was invited. There's a bogey of threat to Islam and to Malays from Chinese, Christian, liberal, pluralist, secularists. There is a thunderous silence from our Sharia establishment when um, either non-Muslims are treated badly or within Muslim, the Shias are treated badly, where there is ill treatment of women by husbands, when there are child marriages, when non-Muslims, mothers are deprived of their kids. So I, I think there are some justifications. Muslims are culpable for the kind of fear that Islam arouses today. So what can be done? What can be done? I want to end on a positive note. I agree with Prof. Uh, Jeffrey fully. I think Muslims must build interfaith relationships. It's entirely correct that when people get to know each other, mutual respect uh, will arise. Uh, it is imperative that Muslims in Western societies must integrate with their societies and build interpersonal relations and contacts with non-Muslims. And I have to say this about Muslims in the society itself. In the 60s and 70s, there was this interpersonal relationship, but uh, it's not a matter of the past. If Muslims can be seen as normal, everyday persons with the same hopes, dreams, and desires for their children as Western mothers and fathers, then their acceptance, the acceptance of Muslims as humans outside of the stereotyped identity will be easier. Secondly, education about Islam must be disseminated. Most prejudices are born out of ignorance. Islam has a lot to offer to the world, and um, uh, this is really uh, not uh, within the topic. Let me just very quickly say, according to the Pakistani scholar Akbar Ahmad, Islam's notion of balance between deen and dunya is a worthy one. Islam can provide a corrective and check to the crass materialism that engulfs modern civilization. Islam has a message against the excesses of capitalism, the abuses of the futures market, and the power of speculative capital. Islam promotes environmentalism and responsible consumerism. It requires the state to provide the needy with a welfare net, but it also asks private individuals to assist in the task of helping the poor. I know of a case in Pakistan where the Sharia courts ordered a rich Muslim relative to give support to a poor Muslim relative if you are close enough in relationship that you could inherit from each other. Um, um, in Islam, state sovereignty is rejected. There can be no supreme parliament or supreme executive or supreme ruler. Islamic ideal is limited and responsible government. Islam requires the government to be conducted through shura or consultation. Islam opposes moral anarchy and excessive individualism. It gives freedoms, but says that freedom per se has no value. It is what freedom is for. Islam can offer compassion, piety, and a sense of humility. The sufistic message of sulhi qal, that is peace with all, is especially relevant in our troubled world. Islam places knowledge at the highest level of human endeavor. It is not just a coincidence that the first word of revelation was Iqra. Iqra bismillah rabbika lazi khalaq. Read. So Islam places great emphasis on knowledge. Islamic principles of ijtihad, that is independent reasoning, shura, consultation, ijma. Uh, that is consensus, encourage flexibility, 
rational choice and dynamism, but I'm afraid this is not what Muslims are practicing. Uh, 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 Muslims in this country and abroad must let go of the aggressive da'wah of proselytization. I think we must remember uh, that our manners, our behavior, our speech, our character are the best form of da'wah. It is not what you say, it is what you do. It is how you live with others that is the best form of da'wah. In Islam as in other religions, there is tremendous diversity of thought. Muslims must not suppress it and must see it as part of our richness. We must abjure violence to solve our problems in relation to the despicable acts of terror by some deranged fellow Muslims. We must respectfully remind our Western counterparts that there is a distinction between the faith and the faithful. The entire religion cannot be conflated with extremist, extremist elements within the religion. Otherwise, we will have to ascribe the horrendous acts of every criminal or warmonger to his religion. We'll have to ascribe the Holocaust, the bombing of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, colonialism, slavery with other religions. And that is absolutely unjustifiable. So I think we must distinguish between faith and the faithful. Hostile views about Islam must be rebutted indeed, but respectfully. In this age of the internet, giving wings to ideas is easily possible, and I congratulate organizations like Islamic Renaissance for putting forward the Islamic view, but respectfully and with civility and civilization. We have to reform Muslim thinking. Uh, I, I'm sure um, uh, all of you, most of you will agree with me. At the moment, the dominant uh, version of Islam is prohibit and punish. Prohibit and punish. Uh, um, the uh, idea of compassion, mercy, love, justice, equality, that's not emphasized. I think we need to lock, unlock the doors of ijtihad, need to rely on ijma, qiyas, istisan, istisla, uh, forms of reasoning to resolve the new problems that are coming to the fore. So by way of conclusion, I just want to say this. Uh, I'm fully in agreement that uh, Islamophobia is a serious problem. I want to, however, confess that Muslims are not free from blame. The way Muslims are um, articulating a very narrow version of Islam scares not only non-Muslims, it scares some Muslims like me. <laughs> so I think now, uh, we've got to have a new approach towards Islam. There is so much richness in it. And uh, if Muslim organizations like Islamic Renaissance can continue with their good job, inshallah, God willing, we'll be able to rebut this. And uh, I'm very happy to hear from uh, Prof. Jeffrey that there are many organizations in the USA that are already doing it. Uh, I know there are some in the UK, and I hope and pray that this quest will continue. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum.